Hello, today we're going to talk about Structure 3.1.10. This is an HL only topic, and it's all about transition element complexes and how they form their colorful solutions. Let's review a few things about light really quick. Um, we know that um, frequency and wavelength are re related using this equation, C equals lambda F, um, where C is the speed of light. And this equation is given in the uh, data booklet as well as the value for the speed of light, which is 3.0 times 10 to the eighth meters per second, where the wavelength has to be in meters and the frequency then must be in inverse seconds. Um, this is the same thing as Hertz, but we typically write it as uh, S negative one. So when we're talking about waves, right, light travels as waves, we have this is our first wave, this is the second wave. The wavelength is the distance between two crests, and so the second wave here, if I call this one B and this one A, A has a longer wavelength, B has a shorter wavelength. Frequency is the number of waves that pass a point in a particular amount of time. Um, so if I assume that this is the same amount of time and I count the waves, this is like three waves and this one would be like six waves. So this one has a higher frequency and this one would be a lower frequency. So you can see that wavelength and frequency are inversely related, which matches the equation C equals lambda F. Um, you should be able to calculate using that equation um, and you should be able to plug in the frequency or the wavelength and solve. Um, one thing I do want to point out is that wavelength is frequently given in nanometers and um, the prefix, the metric prefixes uh, for nano are in the data booklet as well. Um, but one nanometer is equal to one times 10 to the negative ninth meters. For some reason for me it just sticks out like nano starts with n and nine starts with n and so that's how I remember it. It's not perfect, but it helps. I also want to point out um, another resource in your data booklet is the color wheel. And so this image is straight from the IB data booklet. Uh, so you'll see the wavelength ranges for each of those different colors of visible light. There's also an electromagnetic spectrum in the data booklet showing all of the different types of electromagnetic radiation. Um, including the visible light, uh, but the color wheel is going to be really helpful for this section in particular because we can figure out complementary colors. And so complementary colors are those that are across from each other on the color wheel. Orange is complementary to blue and vice versa. Red is complementary to green and vice versa. And violet is complementary to yellow and vice versa. Um, so that's going to help us figure out um, the difference between the colors that are being absorbed versus the colors that we see um, being reflected back. Okay, so let's get into why our transition metal complexes are colorful. Um, let's take copper as our example. Now, if we remember, copper, neutral copper, has the electron configuration 4s1, 3d10, I'm going to draw all 10 here. Okay, so that's neutral copper. When copper forms an ion, let's say copper is forming the 2 plus ion, it's going to lose the 4s electron first, and then it will lose an electron from the D. This leaves our D sublevel with an empty spot, and that's how we know it's going to make a very colorful solution. So Effectively, what happens is that this D sublevel can split, and we call it D orbital splitting. And it's typically going to split into three orbitals and two orbitals. So I'm going to draw it like this, where um, I'm going to do the first three orbitals on the bottom, and the last two orbitals up here at the top. And so this is the split d orbital for a copper two plus ion which forms when it's in a complex ion 
Um, so let's say that this is the complex CuH2O6 2 plus, whereas this one is just copper two ions. Okay. So in this complex, we have the split d orbitals. If the solution is gaining energy, like light, energy from just light around it, the light's going to come in and it can actually promote one of these electrons in the bottom to go up into that empty spot um, in the top there. And so that is a certain amount of energy that's being absorbed. Okay, energy absorbed. That energy that is absorbed is going to correspond to a certain color of visible light. The opposite color on the color wheel, complementary color, is what we're going to see reflected back because that color is not absorbed. Um, and so that's kind of how this works. There's a certain amount of energy is required to promote an electron between the two parts of the d orbital, d sublevel. And um, whatever that energy is, that, that color of light is being absorbed. The opposite color of light must be trans, um, reflected back. It's a better way to think of that. So let's talk a little bit more about the color that's absorbed and transmitted. Um, it lets, let me draw really quick that copper complex again. Cu H2O6. And if I have my split D sublevel like this, it takes a certain amount of energy to promote one of those elect electrons up to the higher energy half of that split D sublevel. So that energy that is absorbed corresponds to a particular color of visible light. And so let's say in this case, it's absorbing orange light. And because it's absorbing orange light, the complementary color on your color wheel is blue. So complementary to orange is blue. And so our solution appears blue to our eyes. Now, um, in terms of questions, how can we ask questions about this? You, you could be given information about a particular solution. So, uh, you know, here is a copper complex and is a blue color. Um, you could then be asked to find the wavelength or the energy or the frequency of that light. So because it appears blue, you would need to reference your color wheel and find the wavelengths that apply for orange light. And from there, you would use C equals lambda F and plug in the wavelength that you found for orange light in meters. And you can solve for frequency using the speed of light. Once you have frequency, you could also be asked to find the energy. Um, the equation E equals HF is also in your data booklet. E is energy in joules, where H is the Planck's constant, which is in your data booklet, and F is still frequency. So once you find frequency, you could go into and find energy in joules. Um, so those are the different like pieces that you could have to find for this section. So there's a few different factors that affect the color of solution that we are seeing and the color being absorbed. And um, one of those is the identity of the transition metal. So the identity of the transition metal. Uh, so like an MN2 plus um, central atom in the complex ion is going to behave differently than an iron 2 plus. Uh, the central atom in that complex ion because they have different protons and so the energy required to promote the electrons in the D sublevel is going to be different. The Also what's going to affect it is the oxidation state for similar reasons. If I have an Fe2 plus central atom versus an Fe3 plus central, um, again you're going to have a different um, amount of energy required because you have a different oxidation state on the iron there. Um, and then finally, the identity of the ligand itself will affect it. Um, so a difference between, let's say, um, Fe with four ammonias versus Fe with six waters. And so the, the difference between the ligand themselves can cause the energy required for the electron to move between parts of the D sublevel will be different. 
This is a good point in time to quickly review Beer's Law because we frequently use Beer's Law procedures to figure out concentrations of transition metal complexes. Um, and so Beer's Law, if I abbreviate A equals EBC, I say E, it's, it's really a Greek letter, but um, where A is the absorbance, this is a constant, it's called the molar absorptivity constant, B is the path length, and C is the concentration. So assuming that all of our testing equipment is the same size, the path length will be the same. And um, if this is a constant for a particular type of substance, then that will be the same. And so that gives us a relationship with a greater absorbance leads to a greater concentration. And so the tool that we use for Beer's Law is called a spectrophotometer. And we typically use cuvettes in the spectrophotometer because they're square, and so we can very easily measure the path length. And um, effectively, a single color of light, typically a single color of light, is passed through the solution. And we test to see how much of the light gets through. Um, and you can put that in a like percent transmittance, but it is much easier for us to measure with absorbance. Uh, and so if you have very little concentration, more of the light will be able to get through. If you have a very high concentration, more of the light will be absorbed. And um, this is very related to what we're talking with, with the color wheel. Whichever, whatever color you see the substance being, like if it's blue, you want to use a complementary color um, of light to um, do your testing because the complementary color is going to be absorbed the best. So if I have a blue solution, I want to use like an orange um, light that will be absorbed really well. And, um, and then from there we can use the constant and the path length to determine the concentration of the solution that you're testing. Let's do a few examples for this section. Um, we've got this nickel and ammonia complex, and we want to find the oxidation state, the coordination number of the complex, and the three-dimensional shape. So this is kind of a review question, but ammonia, if you remember, ammonia is a neutral ligand, and so that plus two charge in the overall ion must be coming pretty much only from the nickel itself. So it has an oxidation state of two plus. The coordination number is the number of um, lone pairs that is um, around the central nickel atom. So in this case, because we have ammonia, ammonia, ammonia is a monodentate ligand, has one lone pair each, and there are six of them. Um, we know that the coordination number of this complex is six. In the three-dimensional shape, anytime you see six as the coordination number, we know that it is octahedral overall. Okay, so for this example, we need to suggest why the color of this chromium water complex is different from the color of this iron water complex. And you'll notice they have the same charge, and because water is neutral, they must have the same oxidation state. So we've got the same ligand, same oxidation state, but the only thing different is the identity of the transition metal itself, and um, that's going to be why they have a different color. Um, most likely because they have different numbers of protons, it's going to require a different amount of energy to promote an electron from one part of that split D sublevel to another. All right, and then for this example, um, we've got two different iron water complexes. So our transition metal has the same identity. Our ligand has the same identity. But in this case, we've got different charges on the complex. And so because water is a neutral ligand, Fe has a plus 3 oxidation state, and iron here has a plus 2 oxidation state. So that difference in oxidation state of the transition metal central ion um, makes it so that there's a different amount of energy required to promote an electron from one part of the D sublevel to the other. Okay, so these, um, this information about complex ions links to reactivity 3.4. Um, what is the nature of the reaction between transition element ions and ligands? Transition ions, um, transition element ions are positively charged, like positive oxidation states, and they act as Lewis acids. 
the ligands um, typically have lone pairs or maybe even a negative charge, and they will act as Lewis bases. And so this is an acid-base type reaction, Lewis acid and Lewis bases, where the Lewis bases are donating electrons, the Lewis acids are accepting the electrons um, in the formation of these complex ions. And of course, this links to um, some of our tools for chemistry, tool one, and then inquiry two. Um, we use colorimetry or spectrophotometry to calculate the concentration of a solution of colored ions. Again, that's relating back to Beer's Law, where you pass a color of light through a solution. And you want to make sure that the whatever color the solution appears, you want to use a complementary color of light. Um, so if I have a green solution, I want to use red light to test it, because red light is absorbed the best. And the greater the concentration, greater the concentration, the greater the absorbance. Because there's more particles to absorb the light. Um, and the relationship, the mathematical relationship there is A equals EBC, where A is absorbance, C is concentration, B is path length, the distance the light has to travel through the solution, and E is the molar observativity constant.